Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of our Sunday lecture series through the Humanist Association of San Diego. Our group is committed to community, to advocacy, to service, and to education. As a humanist group, and a humanist group that's been around for 50 years now, providing an educational service on what humanism is for the general public and our membership is a vital, vital output of our, of our group. And so today is a brand new lecture. It's called Humanism 101, The Science of Being Good. And through this lecture, it's a simple one-on-one type class. I'm gonna bring up concepts. I'm going to bring up brain structures, hormones, schools of thought, and some scholars that I think are particularly interesting. And through this, I hope to answer the question if we are hardwired to be good and ways that we can cultivate that even more. Without further ado, the lecture. And we are going to have a question and answer period following this. So here we go. So this is the science of being good. We're the Humanist Association of San Diego. And I like these events where we can go to the fundamentals, the simple 101 of what we're talking about, so we can gain a better understanding of who we are as a community, our central values, and to not only answer some questions and gain an understanding, but spark discussion and provoke further questions. Because in the study of anything, the central goal is not the answer. The central goal is to pro provide some information to ask more questions about. So we are the Humanist Association of San Diego. We're a secular and ethical humanist group. And here is our lecture. This is from Jonathan Haidt, a social psychologist. Imagine this. You see a man, just a normal guy, works a nine to five job, he's single, volunteers in his community, goes to church every Sunday, pays his taxes on time, has never broken the law. He's responsible, he's frugal, he doesn't even eat out that often. And right now he wears his mask. He socially distances himself. From all, all perspectives, this is an upstanding member of the community that you can trust. He's hungry for chicken. So he goes to the store. He buys some vegetables, some onions, some celery, carrots. He buys a chicken carcass that he's going to take home. He goes home. He starts to, to, to clean the chicken. He's going to eat it himself. But in a second, he gains a feeling of arousal. So what he does is after he rinses out the chicken, he takes the chicken carcass, he inserts his penis, he fucks the chicken carcass, he cleans it, then he consumes it by himself. So my question to all of you, was that wrong? You can answer. This is participatory. Was that wrong? I don't know if the chicken liked it or not. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't see the participation window, so you don't have to raise your hand. Just, just, just speak out. So quick question. Did you think that was disgusting? <laughs> sort of. <laughs> I Did thought it was kind of freaky. It was kind of freaky, but he didn't hurt anybody else by yeah. doing it. There yeah, you go. no harm principle. Yeah, it, it was actually very strange and weird, not normal behavior, but he's not hurting anybody else. Privacy of his own home, uh, I guess, go for it. If it brings him pleasure and doesn't hurt anybody. But here's a question. Did you think that that was weird or did you feel that that was weird and disgusting? Did you oh. think it was disgusting or did you feel that it was disgusting? Well, as a chicken owner, I don't think my chickens would appreciate being treated like that. Well, yeah. 
if you if you felt revulsion from this, congratulations, you're normal. Secondly, you probably felt revulsion instead of thought revulsion. And you probably felt revulsion because your your wiring led an instinctual reaction from your frontal lobe and amygdala down your vagus nerve to your diaphragm and you felt a diaphragmatic contraction and you felt your stomach churn. This is your neural wiring at, at work. If I were to hold up a doll and play CSI, I would say point on that doll where you felt disgusted. And you would point there around the solar plexus from your diaphragmatic vasovagal diaphragmatic contraction. And then the higher ordered reasoning center of your brain comes in and like, like Dick said, well, it wasn't hurting anything. We have two separate forms of cognition. We have a gut morality and we have, we have a deliberative moral, moral set of moral reasoning. Jonathan Haidt writes about this. Other scholars write about that. I'll get to that in just a second. But the fact of the matter is, you, you, unless you had significant damage or removal of your orbitofrontal cortex or your ventromedial prefrontal cortex, you probably felt a sense of revulsion to this. You had no choice over the matter. You had no choice of the matter because this violated a major social norm. Sorry, I had a question. Um, I kind of sure. heard the whole story. So did he, did he, Kill it and then have sex with it? Or? Oh, no, no, he, he bought it already killed from the store. It was, it was already killed from the store. From the store. Okay. It was already dead. He was going to consume it. And the whole, the, whole, the whole thought experiment was based on he's only doing this for himself. He's not giving this to anyone else. No one else has witnessed this. And so the question is, is it wrong? Which, of course, what happens in your brain is you feel that it's wrong, and then your upper level brain kicks in and you say, ah, well, he wasn't hurting anything. Kahneman talks about this in thinking fast and slow. Okay, I see. Yeah, I, I first thought it was very funny when you first said that. That was my first reaction. I just started laughing, but... Um... <laughs> uh-huh. And laughter, laughter, that's another social contagion that happens to inhibit a, a, an antagonistic response. And I'll get to that later when we talk about Dasher Keltner, who's at the Greater Good Science Center at Berkeley. We're interested in this. The whole idea of studying the inherent workings of human goodness is a brand new field in the social sciences. It's sexy. It's new. It's fascinating. It just fills me with passion and excitement. And I hope that it does the same for you too. And we can look at headlines. One of my favorite news sites is Science Daily. It aggregates, um, it, it, it aggregates abstracts from different, different scientific studies and it talks about them. And here's some, so here's some headlines from, from particular studies over, over just that were discussed over the last three months on, on Science Daily. Researchers discover a specific brain circuit damaged by social isolation during childhood. Being a selfish jerk doesn't get you ahead. We need to talk. Communication prevents inaction by leveraging goodwill. And future autonomous machines may build trust through emotion. Humanism and being good. I want to start with, with philosophy. Then I want to move into biology. And lastly, as we see that biology became a, a, just under the umbrella of chemistry, and I would say that the social sciences are under the umbrella of biology, quite frankly, because we're work, looking at what animals are doing, um, then we'll move into the social sciences. So philosophy, one central qu question throughout the history of philosophy is, what is the good? What is the good life? What is bad? How do we negotiate both of those particular concepts? Of course, when we're talking about philosophy, particular Western philosophy, we can't ignore Aristotle. Aristotle worked in this field called virtue ethics. And Aristotle said goodness was based on arete, the excellence of character, 
goodness of, of, of conduct, conduct practicum, and to lead a life extolling the virtues, eudaimonia. And with virtue ethics, the idea is that you're either virtuous or you're not. Um, Daniel Kahneman in Thinking Fast and Slow says that we're not, no one is exclusively virtuous, but we can, we can work towards that. And the value of someone's virtues and the goodness of someone inherently isn't seen during their lives while they're living, breathing, and operating. It's a, some aggregate calculation at the end of their life. And then we also look at two other areas of philosophy. We look at deontology, and Immanuel Kant is the name that comes to mind when we think of duty-based ethics or deontology. And the idea is to rise above your, your animal impulses to achieve the categor categorical imperative, which demonstrates what a free action should be. And in the process, there are other moral imperatives such as don't treat, treat everyone as it ends always and not merely a means. And a free and, and good action is, is not pursuing your own lusts. It's doing the right thing that everyone else would do under all, all similar circumstances. That's the categorical imperative. And it's based upon intention, not based upon what happens after the fact. Goodness is by intention. Then we look at Jeremy Bentham, John Stuart Mill, and the utilitarians, um, those, who, those who are the consequentialists. It's not your intention, but the results of your actions that, that determine if something is good or not. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, for example. And philosophy also provides us with ideas of reciprocal altruism and about other, other, other forms of utility to, to minimize expense. For example, Rousseau talks about cooperation. He says it's like hunting. You can either hunt stag or you can hunt hare. If you hunt hare, a rabbit, you'll eat for a day by yourself. But if you cooperate, what's going to happen? You're going to have the entire group eating for days on end because you worked together in cooperation. You, you minimized your effort to maximize your value through cooperation. And then there's another thing in philosophy I wanted to bring up because I'll bring it up later. And we talked about this last week in our discussion following Hector Garcia's talk, The Trolley Problem. Who here is familiar with The Trolley Problem? And again, I can't see who raises their hand, so. If someone's familiar with the trolley problem, just take a stab at it or take, give it a good push. Oh, I've heard it, but go ahead and repeat it if nobody else has. Yeah, I, I'm familiar with it. Sure, Judy. The trolley problem? Okay, the way I understand it is uh, you're standing on a bridge, you see a trolley approaching, um, and beyond where the trolley is, the track splits. And the way the track is currently configured, the trolley is going to hit four people on the tracks. There's a lever next to you, and you can pull the lever. And if you pull the lever, you'll divert the trolley on the other track. But unfortunately, there's one person standing there. And uh, so will you pull the lever or not? And most people put in that circumstance, it says, yeah, I'd pull the lever. And I would say four people, unfortunately, sacrificing one who otherwise wouldn't have been killed. Um, and then they take it to the next step and said, okay, imagine the same scenario. But now instead of a lever, you have a person that you can push off the bridge that would land on the track and divert the, the trolley. Uh, would you do that? And uh, people feel like, no, I, I can't do that. I have a visceral reaction. I can't purposely push somebody else, even though the results would end up being the same. That's mm -hmm. the way I understand it. Mm -hmm. And we're going to so get kind of like gut versus mind again. Oh, yeah. yeah. And we're going to get into that. We're going to get into that when it relates to brain damage, where people have damaged one of the social centers of their brain, how they look at this. So humanism. <laughs> Ruby. Okay. Humanism. This is our philosophy. And there are some components of humanism that I think are, are, are necessary to meditate upon 
while we talk about about the science of being good because humanism has been around for a while and the humanism was around before behavioral economics and, ethol and modern ethology and we've been committed to certain principles that that speak to what's being discovered today not that we knew it beforehand but the way our philosophy works out it's it works in concert with what science is showing us about how we operate humanism of course if we look at the third manifestation of the humanist manifesto it says that humanism focuses on science reason and compassion and why do we add compassion to science because we're human centered in terms of of what we aspire to humanity centered rather than human centered rather than individually centered we also see that this is a natural world that we're living in and there was a thought for a long time about mind body dualism how we have a body and a soul and there is this field of study called conscious realism that sees that our bodies are just antennas that pick up these these um, floating consciences and um, this information from beyond but that's not us we see that we have a body and part of that body is the brain our thinking our feeling our sensations are done in the brain and the spinal cord and with this it's not just us being these mechanical beings but we're not just individuals we are social animals and one of the central core components of humanism is that we find meaning in relationships we find our greatest meaning in relationships and as we go into the sciences in just a second we are hardwired for that absolutely hardwired for that for the sciences i'm going to go over the biological and the social for biology let's talk about the language of mammals some of these brain structures are indicative to mammals. And some of this behavior that we're talking about is indicative to mammals. We're talking about mammals. We're mammals. We have the home team advantage today. And then we'll talk about human brains. The language of mammal. One interesting thing when we look at other animals and we go back to philosophy with religion in the past, with religion in the past. Okay. Yes, I forgot about religion, I apologize. So with religion, religion, in terms of revealed religion, I'll, I'll, I'll narrow this down to the Abrahamic religions, but in the Abrahamic religions, there's this idea that God created, or a God created or many gods, depending on how far you want to go back in the pedigree of the development of the Abrahamic religion. Um, but the idea that some supernatural force created human beings and animals. And then as philosophy and religion went on, these ideas happened that we not only had human beings, but we also had lesser human beings, which were kind of an intermediary step between humans and other animals. And we have this big distinction in philosophy and the social sciences for a long time over the difference between the, the orders of, of human beings and animals, that animals didn't have a soul and animals were just there for our convenience. And then we had a lesser set of human beings who were biologically incapable of higher ordered thought or capable of responsibility. And we, we had, we studied this stuff and, and, and this is where a lot of focus went, where we looked at phrenology and we looked at, at brain sizes and we ordered people into different racial categories. And then later when that started going out the window, we started looking at intentions where people of lesser order, people are seen as lesser ordered human beings were, were seen as not having the intention of, they were lazy so they couldn't they couldn't behave like us as good 
upper level human beings. And this, this miasma of studies over the division between people and people and people and animals, it's changing significantly. It's changing significantly because now we're including this thought of perspective taking. That's one of the next areas, perspective taking. And we see that there's not a lot of difference between human beings and elephants and some certain monkeys, definitely great apes, and cetaceans, whales, dolphins. And with perspective taking, we organize this into the thought of what's called the theory of mind, where if a creature possesses a theory of mind, it has a hyper intentional awareness, where it sees that not only are other creatures there, but they have a mind as well, and they, they have intentions. And the further you go down that line, and, and the, the more sophisticated the brain structures get, you start having these different animals communicating with each other. And I'll get to Franz de Waal in just a second to tell you about cooperation and, and emotional contagions between different animals. But one way they look at this is they do a mirror recognition test where they'll put a marking on where, where there's a bilateral symmetry, they'll put a marking within the field of vision on one side of the face and then marking on the other side of the face within the, the field of vision for a dolphin or a rhesus monkey or a baby human. And if one of these animals that possesses a significant theory of mind sees itself in the mirror, you can tell that it knows that that's itself because it will start looking and preening and, and start going towards the side of the face where the marking is. And so we, this is one of the platforms that we start from, a theory of mind and self-recognition. And the further you go down the chain, you see things like embarrassment happen. Embarrassment. Embarrassment's interesting. It's, it's a social contagion that I'll get to shortly and then definitely under Dasher Keltner. But one quote from Lao Tzu, the founder of Taoism, the old master, he says, embarrassment is, a is like a wave that knocks us to the ground and we all come up embracing and laughing. And another thought that's come into play is the idea of the selfish gene and that this isn't necessarily pro-social, but just a way for selfish competition to take place. Initially thinking that my genes are gonna propagate so it's gonna do everything possible to the exclusion of, of other animals and other creatures um, to, to just propagate our genes, propagate our genes, propagate our genes with, with the central focus of the self and everything else is just a transaction. The researchers that I'm gonna bring up today don't necessarily agree with that. And along with this, like I said, when we're looking at babies, monkeys, dogs, dolphins, um, pachyderms, we see that there are expectations of fairness. We see that there are expectations of fairness. For example, you may have heard the, the studies where you can, and you can do this if you have two dogs, you can take a couple slices of cucumber and a couple sausages and have the dogs perform the same trick and give one of the dogs exclusively the snossages for as a reward for completing the trick and the other dog cucumbers. And after about three or four times where one dog keeps getting the, the tasty meat morsel and the other dog is only getting the cucumber, what's going to happen with the, the behavior of the dog that is only getting the cucumber? What happens? It stops. It says, screw it. This isn't worth my time. This is not fair. You do puppet shows in front of babies and one, and you take two puppets and if one of the puppets is abusive by smacking the other puppet, the baby will start crying. This is, this is where we start from. And this field of study of human behavior in this angle is called ethology. And additionally, we are what's known as an obligatory group obligatory gregarious species. We're a species that's geared to live in social groups. And like Dr. Garcia said in our last lecture, that how we developed is 
emotionally, we, we're set to handle up to around 144 people. And then we have Franz de Waal. He's an ethologist. He works with chimps and bonobos. And his book, Age of Empathy, I, I guarantee you'll enjoy it. You should pick it up. But he talks about how, the, how chimps and bonobos that aren't primed to, to respond in this way, when they see a human being with a stick reaching into their enclosure trying to get to an artifact, the chimp will come over oftentimes and pick up the artifact and like a ball or, or a rock or something and hand it to the human being. So there is a theory of mind and a pro-social altruistic theory of mind. Mind you, altruism is not, exclu is, is not, is not universal. There, there, there are gradients of it. And I'll get to that. But empathy, empathy is a big part of this. Gene Desetti says that there are four prerequisites for empathy, a shared affect, an awareness of the other as, as apart from the self. So there you go, the theory of mind, a mental flexibility, the next step of the theory of mind to put for perspective taking, not just that there's another animal, but that animal has, may have an intention. And you can think about that intention and operate within that intention. And then an emotional self-reflection necessary to promote an appropriate response. And there's a fantastic book that just came out last year called um, The War for Kindness by a Stanford psychologist by the name of Jamil Zaki. And in it, he brings up that empathy is not merely one form of empathy. There are three types of empathy. There's cognitive empathy, identifying what others feel, perspective taking, emotional empathy, that's the mental flexibility to see another person's perspective. And later when we talk about Donald Thoff with the altruistic brain theory, we will go deep into um, emotional empathy. And then lastly, wishing to improve the experience of the other person, empathic concern. Neurology, I would go into chemicals, brain chemicals. These are little messengers that are the impetus for action. Then I'm gonna go over the circuitry. Cortisol, you're familiar with cortisol, right? Cortisol is a stress hormone. There's two types of stress. There's acute stress and chronic stress. Under acute stressful situations, your body secretes epinephrine. You're ready for action. During chronic stress situations, ongoing stressful situations, your brain will secrete cortisol. Cortisol, when you have too much, it's a steroid hormone. And when you have too much, you might start overeating and you'll keep, you'll gain weight. And also cortisol, a, a large amounts of cortisol inhibit the uptake of oxytocin. Dopamine, it's a feel good hormone. It's a, normal, it's a neurotransmitter playing a role in motivation, arousal, reinforcement, and reward. It's released when we eat food that we crave or after we have sex. It's your feel-good hormone that motivates you so you can achieve something. And when we follow through, we get a, a blast of it. We get a blast of it from, from other sources. And um, it's interesting. It's also thought that with attention deficit disorder, that there's a, a, some kind of dopamine reception issue which means that the individual has a difficult time maintaining focus, staying motivated, because they're not getting enough dopamine. So with individuals with ADD and ADHD, we give them medication typically that boosts dopamine in their system to flood the dopamine receptors. Then we reach the love hormone. It's a peptide hormone involved in social bonding. I'm going to get to oxytocin later when we talk about Paul Zak, the love doctor. That's his nickname, the love doctor. He's also known as the vampire economist. And oxytocin, initially, that was seen in terms of a maternal bonding chemical, where they noticed that women who were breastfeeding secreted a lot of oxytocin and absorbed a lot of oxytocin, but then it turned out that men have oxytocin too. And when they were researching this, they said, well, why do men have so much oxytocin if they're not lactating? 
men don't typically lactate. I'm sure that it's possible to with some adequate training and maybe if you don't have a lot to do on a Thursday evening. But the other side of the coin with oxytocin is for your small group, it develops these deep affiliations. Conversely, with the out group, not the in group, it's also associated with aggression towards a group that's perceived to be an out group in competition with your in group. So it's full of love for those who are in your inner circle and it's full of aggression for those who are on the outer circle because you are pair bonding. With, you're bonding with your inner circle while you're competing against the outside group. And testosterone inhibits oxytocin uptake. Another feel-good hormone you might have heard about, serotonin, it's a monoamine neurotransmitter. It's associated with mood regulation, cognition, memory sleep regulation, reward learning, and vasoconstriction. If you have too little of it, you get depressed. And that was intended to be on the cortisol slide about when you are dealing with acute stress, you deal with epinephrine, like, um, chronic stress, you're dealing with cortisol. And of course, testosterone, the male sex hormone associated with aggression, competitiveness, and elevated self-confidence and self-esteem. Dr. Love, Paul Zak. Paul Zak is an economist that looks at the role of oxytocin and trust. It's called the trust hormone. He wrote a fantastic book called The Moral Molecule, another book I absolutely recommend. He's called the vampire economist because he goes into areas with market exchange and trust exercises like where they're deeply emotional, like weddings or tandem skydiving to look at the relationship between trust and oxytocin. And so he goes into those situations and he takes blood samples and he's called the vampire economist. He also talks about how oxytocin can improve our pro-social behavior by having more of it. And to have more of it, you have consensual nurturing touch. For example, in The Moral Molecule, he says when people come into his lab at the Claremont Graduate School in Los Angeles, that when people go into his lab and they meet him, the first thing he says is, by the end of our conversation, I'm gonna hug you. And of course, hugging, as he says, is the original contact time. And this also is related to social grooming like bonobos and gorillas will do. And then additionally, gossip, which is a human, a human next step of social grooming. Because in gossip, we, we, we develop these trust bonds and we also learn who's violating what norm and who else we can trust. And he calls this the home circuit the human oxytocin mediated empathy circuit. And through the, the uptake of oxytocin, it promotes the uptake of serotonin and dopamine. And that calms your anxieties and makes you feel good. So when you're bonding with other people and you're creating deeper bonds with other people, of course, you have to bring down your guard and your body's doing that for you through serotonin and it's helping you feel really good. When you're around a group of friends like today, you probably feel better than you did four hours ago, unless you're around another group of friends. Or when you see a friend that you haven't seen in a very long time, you feel good and you feel like your guard goes down. Laughing also brings your guard down and I'll get to laughing when we talk about Keltner's work. But... Um, this goes into a virtuous cycle. So when our guard is let down and we're feeling good, we tend to be more pro-social and our guard is let down and we become more empathic. And when we become more empathic, it increases our, our moral sense of the world and in the process, it increases the amount of trust that we have, which the amount of trust increases oxytocin. So it becomes this beautiful cycle, this virtuous cycle. Now circuitry, the brain. 
I want to talk about some brain parts and brain systems. The amygdala. It comes from the Latin word for almond. And whenever you hear someone talking about the amygdala, they'll always say, two almond-shaped structures called the amygdala. And it's called the amygdala because the Latin word for, for almond, almond is amygdala. And it's a component of our limbic system, one of the older parts of our brain, and it deals with fear. And it sends signals of fight or flight to the hypothalamus, but it also is involved in some reward um, stimulations. Then we have this area that's really big in mammals called the frontal lobe. Out of the four major lobes in mammals of the brain, this is the largest. And I brought up dopamine. This is where most of the dopamine is processed in the brain. It's the social area of the brain. And it's responsible for social interaction, communication, and here is the seat. It's in the frontal lobe, and it's the seat of embarrassment. Without this particular lobe, you can't feel embarrassed. Is anyone familiar with, and of course, I can't see hands raised, and I don't see everyone's image, so just blurt it out. Is anyone familiar with Phineas Gage? There's a song, a, a folk song, that's called, I've been working on the railroad all the live long day. Phineas Gage was working on the railroad all the live long day. He was a tamper. A tamper is someone who packs the dynamite down, takes a big rod, pushes everything down to pack it, and then steps out of the way and calls for the person controlling the demolition to blast. Well. There was a miscommunication in the misfire, and the rod, as he was packing it down, the person responsible for hitting the button hit the button, and the rod went through his cheek, under his eyes, and out through the other side of his head. It was hot. It cauterized on the way out, and I think he lived for 17 years after that. And they learned something really interesting about how the brain works, because not only did he not die, but he still had almost all of his mental faculties. His personality wasn't the same though. His personality changed dramatically. He, one, one individual who was associated with him saying that he would use the most scurrilous curse words and he, his behavior was wanton and he was reckless and he didn't care about other people anymore. And he was one of the most caring people that that individual had met before him. Why? Because this, the orbitofrontal cortex was gone. The, the spike went right through it. And if you are lacking or you have an abnormality in your orbitofrontal cortex, you don't get embarrassed. It's your seat of embarrassment. And you have a hard time regulating your impulses. Then lastly, we have an emotional area of your brain that deals with um, episodic and semantic, somatic memory. And this also deals with emotions when relating with other people. There's a book that we did in our book club uh, a few weeks ago called A Very Bad Wizard by Tamler Somers. And for those of you who came to the book club, you'll remember that one of the later chapters is called Trolley Problems. And, and Judy, could you remind us again what the trolley problem is? Um, that was the, the problem that people felt comfortable pulling a lever to divert a trolley that would kill one person versus four, but they did not feel comfortable pushing a person off the bridge uh, where one, you know, they would kill one person instead of four if they actually had to physically, you know, push that person. Yeah, because your body won't let you do it your body gives you an, an adverse emotional stimuli. And when a researcher who was interviewed in A Very Bad Wizard in one of the conversations says they look at people who have a ventromedial frontal cortex abnormality, damage or otherwise, and they, they work with the trolley problem under a functional magnetic resonance imaging um, experiment, they, 
this does, they don't have this area to light up. In, in other individuals that are working through this problem, that area of the brain lights up and they can't bring themselves to murder someone to directly push someone off the platform. But with someone with an abnormality in the ventral medial frontal cortex, according to this researcher in Very Bad Wizard, they don't see a difference. It's just a calculation on their part. There's no emotional compunction to, to not push the person. It's just matter of fact. And now onto some wiring. And you guys might have heard of these structures before. If you're a psychologist or a neurologist, you know far more than I do. But for those who are new to this, I hope that you've heard these terms before. If not, now you know them. So there are several types of, of, of neurons that I want to bring up, mirror neurons. Basically, these particular neurons allow for mimicry. Not only mimicry, mimicry they're associated with, with, um, with sympathy pains. They're in the premotor cortex. And we also see their involvement in emotional contagions. Emotional contagions are things that you don't have a control over. You can try to fight it, but certain types of smiles called Duchenne type smiles, I'll get to that under Dasher Keltner. They, they're emotional contagions and they also release oxytocin and dopamine. Then also yawning. Yawning is a social contagion. If you're ever in a, a large room of people and somebody starts to yawn, everybody starts to yawn. Embarrassment is an emotional contagion. If someone starts blushing, you feel for them. You might even start blushing if somebody is embarrassed. And that just is an ex a prime example is how we're geared as a social species, how automatically if you violate some type of norm through the loss of a, a gaffe or a loss of a bodily function, like a fart, for example, you'll feel embarrassed. And, and so you'll have a physiological reaction and other people will have a physiological reaction to that. And it's not something you're thinking about. And, and then lastly, laughing, smiling, laughing, embarrassment and yawning are all social contagions. There is a neurologist at, at UCSD by the name of V.S. Ramachandran, and he used mirror neur neurons to help fix phantom limb pain, where someone has a limb that slowly dies and they feel a lot of pain, like a crushing sensation. What Ramachandran did is he set up a mirror box, and in the mirror box, he had the person squeezing a ball with their, their remaining hand and then letting that go. And through doing that particular therapy, that started relieving the phantom limb's pain. And one of the other, one of the other um, researchers who's doing a lot of mirror neurons is at the UCLA Brain Mapping Center, Marco Iacobini, in an interview with Scientific American, he said, what do we know, what do we do when we interact? We use our body to communicate our intentions and our feelings, the gestures, facial expressions, body postures. We make our social signals, ways of communicating with one another. Mirror neurons are the only brain cells we know that seem to specialize to code the actions of other people and also our own actions. They are obviously essential brain cells for social interactions. Without them, we would likely be blind to actions, the actions, intentions, and emotions of other people. The way mirror neurons likely let us understand others is by providing some kind of inner imitation of the actions of other people, which in turn leads us to simulate the intentions and emotions associated with those actions. When I see you smiling, my mirror neurons smile for smiling fire up too, initiating a cascade of neuronal activity that evokes the feeling we typically associate with a smile. I don't need to make any inference on what you're feeling. I experience immediately and effortlessly in a milder form, of course, what you're experiencing. So more, like I'm saying, like we are a social animal and this lends us to think that we're hardwired to be responsive towards other people unintentionally. Another neuron, and we see these neurons in whales, great apes, elephants, human beings, and some monkeys. They're called von Economo neurons. 
Because of their spindly look, they're called spindle neurons. They're located in the anterior cingulate cortex, which is part of the autonomic nervous system responsible for cognitive functions. They, um, they help us process social emotions and, and moral sense. And um, Francois Wall, who I brought up earlier, said that with the animals that we see that have the greatest ability, they have the most sophisticated um, ability to, to do perspective taking, they have far more um, spindle neurons than, than other creatures. And then lastly, the vagus nerve, which is the, the, uh, the uh, what is it called? Cortical nerve 10. Um, it's the longest nerve in the autonomic nervous system. It's part of the parasympathetic nervous system. When earlier I was talking about the feeling of revulsion um, that contracted your diaphragm, that was from your vagus nerve going from the emotional center of your brain um, down through your diaphragm and giving you that that reaction. Franz de Waal talks a lot about this in Age of Empathy, and he says the vagus nerve is responsible for helping you feel warm-hearted, or if you feel like you have a broken heart, there's a reason it's at your heart, because that's where it's contracting. And it will also, as, as said with Dasher Keltner, um, the vagus nerve also can put the brake on your, your pulse rate to slow your pulse down. And we'll get to that in laughing. And you have the nervous system. You have the central and peripheral nervous systems. The central is your brain and spinal cord. The peripheral nervous system are your nerves that that's, that's branch off of that. You also have your limbic system. The amygdala is part of your limbic system. It's related to emotions, motivations, and memory. And this is the wiring, the social wiring. And then with the peripheral nervous system, you have the autonomic nervous system. And that's responsible for heart rate, respiration, sexual arousal, pupillary response. When we're dealing with social interaction, as Dasher Keltner says, human beings are a face-to-face -face species. We pick up cues from each other's pupils, from dilation. We pick up cues from, from facial twitches and smiles, two types of smiles, um, the one where you show your teeth and the, the soft mouth smile. And with the autonomic nervous system, especially when we're dealing with other people, we spark up the sympathetic nervous system that's responsible for fight and flight. And we have the parasympathetic nervous system, which is associated with the vagus nerve. Uh, the vagus nerve is associated with that. And with this, we not only have, I, I love these, these two. Um, it's like you have fight and flight from the sympathetic nervous system, which is related to the amygdala, but with the parasympathetic nervous system related to the vagus nerve, it's called rest and digest, but I like the other term that's applied to it, feed and breed. So we have fight and flight from the sympathetic and feed and breed from the parasympathetic. On to the social sciences. So we're talking about how we're hardwired to be good. Being good is associated with our, our connections with other people and, and how we maintain social order. So for a long time in, in the field of government, later political science, there was, in political philosophy, thoughts of why we got together. And a lot of it came from more of a negative view of, of human nature, which these scholars that I'm, I'm bringing up today, um, they, they would disagree with this. And these initial political philosophers were Hobbes, who said that people are terrible to each other, inherently terrible. We're always going to be terrible to each other. So we need, we need an overarching king on earth to represent God on earth. And so Hobbes said we need the Leviathan, an all-powerful beneficent dictator to make sure that we are better to each other. And he said that when we don't have that, when we don't have government, it's called the state of nature. And he said that in the state of nature, life is poor, solitary, nasty, brutish, and short. Locke, on the other hand, who came later, another, what, um, 40 years later, wrote about how people were mostly good, but we would take advantage of each other. And so we needed a, a known and impartial third party to arbitrate disputes. And that was the start of government, to have that impartial arbiter to handle disputes over the title of property. And then today, 
we're seeing things differently because we're doing what's called unpacking the black box, which is the brain. Looking at economics, the father of economics, Adam Smith, wrote the theory of moral sentiments where he talked about humanity in a, a much more charitable way than he did in Wealth of Nations. In Wealth of Nations, he came up with this idea called homo economicus, economicus, which is this idea that we were rationally self-interested, we're always out for number one and we'll operate like that. And this idea is, has, has, has reverberated through economics and also um, certain philosophers and authors like Herbert Spencer who took Darwin and he coined a term that's, uh, that's applied to Darwin that Darwin never said, which is survival of the fittest. And then we have Ayn Rand, who's about objectivism, which is about celebrating selfishness, saying that the self, being selfish is the highest good, which contradicts, contradicts what, we, what we're learning now about ethology through people who aren't just thinking about it or doing game theoretical models of pure theory, but actually putting people under, under fMRI machines, doing large social surveys, da 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 da. And here's where we get to the behavioral sciences. So we look at neurology, I brought up Phineas Gage, and there's a neurologist who's coming up with this idea called altruistic brain theory, where he's tying a lot of other theories and thoughts together. In it, he says there's five steps to um, altruistic brain theory. You're a central nervous system, and that's your, your brain and your um, limbic system. It processes the action that you're gonna take. And in cognitive processes, your brain, your brain copies it. So it sends one copy of that to your central nervous system and another copy to your parasympathetic nervous system, to your peripheral nervous system. And that way it initiates a potentiation of what you might do. And then it sends it down to the parts of your body that are gonna do something. So when the brain decides to do something, your body is cued up. In the moral landscape, Sam Harris talks about um, free will from whether or not your body just does this without any conscience awareness or, or, or otherwise. But the potentiality comes there. Your central nervous system registers it. Then your frontal lobe starts thinking about how the other people involved in your action with them. And then you start blurring the image between them and yourself to gain a perspective on how they act. Then your prefrontal cortex um, sets up the, oh, oh yeah, then, then you blur that, then you get a feeling and your prefrontal cortex acts. And, and then one thing that interrupts that is if it's a markedly antisocial act, then steps four and five about the potentiation of the act is stopped and you don't act. And oftentimes you don't think about this, it just happens. It's altruistic brain theory from David Pfaff, who this comes from a book that he published of the same name. Then we look at social psychology. And I brought up the chicken example earlier from Jonathan Haidt. And he talks about moral cognition um, by the gut cognition, a visceral moral cognition, and a deliberative cognition where you think about it afterwards. In political thought, political science, when we look at political reasoning, it's the same way. When we look at subjects like abortion, gay rights, et cetera, et cetera, we get a feeling or we look to, and that feeling is often based upon experts that we know that we can trust regardless if we can or not. And then we vote or we start talking about our opinions based upon those feelings. And then we rationalize after the fact using a series of cognitive shortcuts are called heuristics. Then Dasher Keltner and Jamil Zaki. In, uh, I think it was 2009, Dasher Keltner put out his book, Born to be Good, The Science of Meaningful Life. And this is a great overview for those who want to get a greater perspective on how we're hardwired to feel good. And Keltner relates this to Eastern philosophy under Confucianism, under the idea of gen or, or good actions under um, a good behavior under Confucianism. And he says, we have to up our gen ratio, which is good behavior versus bad behavior. And in it, he talks about human biology. He's a psychologist that studies um, 
hu the human physicality in relation to behavior. For example, he talks about human beings are, are, are a directively front-facing species from how, how mothers will carry their children and how children nurse being able to look up into their mother's eyes, how we do all of our interactions looking into each other's eyes, how embarrassment is associated with looking away from someone's eyes, looking down, etc. cetera. Um, in it, he, he also looked at the trolley problem and he, he noted that the trolley problem with areas like the orbitofrontal cortex, which deals with social emotion, areas like that light up when we deal with the trolley problem because our brains are, 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 are co-opting our, our, our greater sense of deliberative reasoning to, to, to manage how we're, how we're interacting even hypothetically with others. Um, so how we're seeing the world is based upon how our brains are, 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 are managing how we act with other people against, against deliberative thought. Then he talks about feeling and how feeling goes through your body how anger, he brings it to interesting, like anger and, and, and anxiety are associated with changes in temperature. And we have metaphors associated with that. In anger, you're, you, you have, you're, you're, you're hot with anger or you have cold feet for anxiety. And that's dealing with how your body's interacting with um, flooding your, your, your extremities with blood, hot blood, and then, then constricting your, your vasculature to bring, when you're afraid, back to the core. And he also talks about the social contagions of embarrassment and says that kindness is also contagious. And to go back to what um, Paul Zak said about how the, 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 the home circuit of human oxytocin-mediated um, experience, I think he said, how in kindness we increase our oxy we increase our, our dopamine and our serotonin so we lower our guard and we feel better and this this extends out to other people too we we, we get a good feeling and in the process other people get a good feeling and then this starts a virtuous cycle of, of people doing pro-social behavior and we also have other other mechanisms of that, that, that demonstrate of, of how much we're a social organism where in tense situations, what laughter will do is laughter will empty your lungs out through ha ha ha. And also he mentions how close friends and strangers have different laughs. If, if you study it linguistically and you study, you, you, do, you do a micro study on, on the vocalizations of laughter, there's a different laugh for people you're close to and people that you're not close to. And when you're laughing with someone in a tense situation, it also lowers your heart rate and it, it, it essentially immobilizes your, your extremities. So you can't fight when you're laughing. You can't fight when you're laughing. And, and I think that's awesome that something that's pro-social, laughter is contagious and it inhibits conflict. And additionally, he brings up touch. Like, Dasher, like, like, like Paul Zach brings up touch. It's the contact high, where touch lowers the heart rate. It increases dopamine. It increases oxytocin, which builds trust. And through trust, we also see that in gossip. Gossip builds trust because we learn who we can trust and who we can't. And people lower their guard. They might be saying disparaging things, but that's also a necessary component of, of the social, social engagement of the organisms at play and their social action to know who they can trust. And in a social species, for it to uh, uh, an obligatory gregarious species, they have to know who they can trust. That is a, that's, a, a pro that's a product of capital. It's called social capital. And, and then with smiling, Dasher Keltner has done a lot of research on smiling. There's the, there's the retail smile that many of us have done retail. We know it. We smile. We smile through all those dumb jokes. Like if you've been in retail recently, there's always the guy who gives you the $20 bill. And you're supposed to check the $20 bill for being counterfeit. And quick question, 
What is the thing that per, they're, they're trying to have a positive social interaction with you, but what is the one thing that person always says when they hand you the $20 bill that you have to check because that's company policy? What's the one thing they always say? And if you Nobody, have, oh, go ahead. Nobody's giving me a $20 bill. <laughs> well, for those of you who haven't worked retail, please don't say this because it's, it's the most grating thing out there. When they hand you the $20 bill, they're trying to be nice, but here's how you get it. And you get the forced smile of, because you have to, it's, oh, I made that this morning. And if you hear that 17 <laughs> times a day, it's like, uh-huh, uh-huh. And the thing I is- I know that feeling. Yeah, you've heard that before, right? right? <laughs> yeah. Yes, I have multiple oh, times. Oh, made that this morning. <laughs> You're like, oh, damn, I got a smile. Oh, yeah. Oh, you did a good job. Yep. And that thing is you cannot have, you cannot, even if you try to even have a precisely symmetrical smile, it's impossible. There are something like 108 facial exhibitions through um, this study called the Facial Action Coding System. And you look at social interaction, you can see dishonesty, anger, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And there's one type of smile that's authentic, that's associated with bonding, that you have no control over. There's two muscles, one here and one here. And they contract. And it puckers down, lowers down your, your lower eyelid, and which causes a wrinkle. And it lifts up the sides of your, 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 your lip. And what that does is it's symmetrical. And when the other person sees that smile, even in a picture, it releases oxytocin. There's a trust smile. That's a legitimate, sincere smile. And Dasher Keltner goes further. He gives recommendations on how to, how to increase, increase empathy, and pro-social behavior because we need to work on it, especially when we have division that's constantly before us. He says that we need to increase our experience of awe. And I'll get to awe in the last thing I say. Then we get to behavioral economics. For a long time, economics was that market theory about people be about rational choice theory and people being self-interested and working for themselves and, and basically saying, oh, the free hand of the market will take care of it. But the behavioral economists, they started working with the cognitive psychologists and they started practicing cognitive psychology. And they started thinking about things and they were thinking, well, if everything that we're working with is based upon rationality, then why do people act so irrationally? And what they, what they determined is that rationality is not at play here. For example, you have the economic theory of arbitrary coherence. I'm guilty of it too. Do you know what kind of cell phone this is? Apple, along with my Apple Watch, along with my iPad. And what do I do when I'm listening to my iPad, when I'm listening to a, a program? I listen on my AirPods and I'm talking to you guys courtesy of an iMac. It might not be the most economical purchase. I didn't make them all at the same time, mind you. I'm, I'm on an iMac that's several years old. And, but, 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 the thing is like, if it were a rational thing, even if I thought about status, I might go Android because it might be cheaper, it might be easier to repair, easier to replace. And so, or even there's a company out there that's specializing in customizable iPhones where you can open it up and replace a part. They're cheaper, easier to replace, but I'm stuck with Apple. You might be stuck with a brand as well. Behavioral economics looks into all of this and it says people aren't rational. So instead of looking at the world on how we've assumed it is, let's look at how people actually act when we study economics. And we, we notice a, a whole different perspective. And like I said before, with humanism, we're focused on science and reasoning. 
and we're focused on human beings and we need to look at how people actually operate instead of just assuming they're gonna operate in a particular way. Because the way that we've assumed that people operate for a long time, it's functionally wrong. And that's why this stuff is so intriguing. And that's why this stuff is so fascinating. Because A, we're interested in other people, but B, to, to learn how we actually operate. And I mentioned that term a moment ago, social capital. You want to know how to make a, a governing institution work or a neighborhood association work? Understand social capital. Political science has been moving in the direction of behavioral economics in, in several subfields, biopolitics and political behavior. And like I mentioned earlier about heuristics and political cognition, there's also another book I recommend called The Race Car by Tally Mandelberg. And in it, what she writes about is in society, we have, we have latent predispositions to misogyny and racism, et cetera, et cetera. That's inborn with, within us. But we also have competing norms of equality that, that come and, and, and operate. And how do, we, how do we go from generation to generation seeing significant shifts? Well, here's how we do it. We get an overriding norm of equality through enough people that people might not necessarily be getting rid of their racist inclinations. They're just more afraid of being embarrassed for being seen to violate a norm of equality. Embarrassment drives a lot of human behavior. We're terrified of, of action if it might cause some kind of social sanction. So embarrassment, right then and there, and I, I talked, I've discussed how embarrassment works neurologically, but embarrassment in terms of a social application, sometimes there's a value to shame. Sometimes there's not. Sometimes there is. And there we go. These are out of sequence. In social capital, Robert Putnam isn't the person who invented the idea of social capital, but he's a well-respected well, well scholar on this subject, wrote half a dozen books. In his book, Making Democracy Work, in one of the later chapters, because he's looking at why Southern Italy is so different than Northern Italy, and why Southern Italy with the government is so corrupt, but Northern Italy has a more responsive government. He published this book in 84, and in it, <laughs> he said it dealt with social capital, trust. This goes back to what Cicero said, who said that there is no duty more indispensable than returning a kindness. All men distrust one forgetful of a benefit. Like the babies and the dogs who don't like to see unfairness and don't like to see reciprocal altruism at play. The same goes for government, absolutely for government. We don't like hypocrisy in government. We also like to see responsiveness in government and in society. So with this, we have several ideas, and these are factors that are at play. It's called the tragedy of the commons. The tragedy of the commons is out, out, in, out in society, you may do your part, but that doesn't mean other people are gonna do their part as well. And those people that might take advantage of the system and just, you know, not, 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 not walk across the grass or if there's a, a norm that when a light bulb goes out that some, somebody in the apartment complex is going to go change the light bulb. And if you see the light bulb out, it's your duty. If you see something, say something or do something, they'll just take advantage of it. Sure, that's there. That's called the free rider problem. But for the most part, we can overcome this by, by setting up norms. And these norms are through social capital. The social capital, if you don't use it, it falls apart. But if you use it and you use it a lot, it just grows and trust builds in each other. Every member of the, the social group. And yeah, you might have some sociopaths, but it's, it's overcome when the majority of the people are following through doing their part. So this is through what's called a rotary credit association. The idea that all members make regular contributions 
they expect everyone else to do so and those who don't get ostracized. And the capital in social capital is trust. It's, it, in his book, he says, we cultivate a norm of trust. Norms of social capital have a low transactional cost, which is just what you're doing every day. You don't have to go out of your way. It's what everyone else is doing. It facilitates reciprocity, where if there's a fear of embarrassment of ostracism or just embarrassment, people are go who, who don't do it are, are coerced to doing it, but everyone else seems to just be doing it because of the trust that's been built. Um, Putnam says, norms arise when an action has similar externalities for a set of others, yet, may, yet markets in the rights of control on the actions of the action cannot easily be established. And no single actor can profitably engage in exchange to gain rights of control. Norms are inculcated and sustained by modeling and socialization and by sanctions. And he talks about norms of generalized reciprocity. Re reciprocity is, I scratch, you scratch my back, I scratch your back. Norms of generalized reciprocity and networks of civic engagement encourage social trust and cooperation because they reduce incentives to defect. Everyone benefits. Reduce uncertainty because we have each other's back and provide mo models for future cooperation because if we've cooperated in the past, we know that we do it and we know how to do it. Trust itself is an emergent property of the social system as much as a personal attribute. Individuals are able to be trusting and not merely gullible because the social norms and networks within which their actions are embedded. And, and then, like I said earlier about grooming, and we, we groom each other, and gossip, and just our, our regular conversations with each other, we, we know who might screw us over, we know who, who isn't. We, we develop an internal list social list of who we can trust and who we can't. And the question is, can this just be brought down from the government? The answer is probably not, because you don't know who you can trust in the government. This thing has to be more organic and more horizontal than vertically established. And so with this, looking at how we are hardwired to be emotional in our emotions in physicality, they, they compel us to act in a pro-social way as, as Dr. Pfaff says, that our brains inhibit us for the most part when it comes to um, an antisocial action. And then also looking at how oxytocin and, and these other hormones and our, our trust bonds they, they, they allow us to be really good with a small group of people, but also aggressive to outgroups that we perceive as competitive. We, we do all of this, um, but at the same time, we have competing forces that might encourage us to be selfish. And being good isn't just to be taken for granted. These are our inherent impulses, but there are ways to encourage being good, to cultivate being good. And they're inherently social, and they're also individual, but mostly social. And the individual ways also orient us, like Dasher Keltner was saying to increase a sense of awe. They orient us to, to understand our place in the system of things. So one way to do this is to read, to read up on these books, to read the articles. Some of these authors are fascinating and page turners, like, like, like Paul Zak. I loved his book, Moral Molecule. Or Kahneman. Kahneman's a, a must read, thinking fast and slow. Start a book club. Or have somebody like myself read a bunch of this stuff and then get a bunch of people together on a Sunday afternoon to become indulgent to say, hey, everyone, look how smart I am for reading this stuff. But then we go and we engage in a conversation. And then if you read this stuff, then you can say you were right. wrong on it. Right, it's off in 20 minutes. Hmm? Oh, sorry. And then we correspond with the researchers. I guarantee that if you look up, you look up Paul Zak at the Claremont Graduate School, 
you're going to see his email. And if you've read his stuff and you're curious, I, I don't know, his, I've corresponded with him. And I'm going to correspond with a number of these other authors and ask them to come and speak. I've corresponded with Dasher Keltner. I've corresponded with Franz DeWall. It's, you can become part of the learning community and correspond with these, these people looking at these particular, particular aspects. Hell, you could spend another six years and then become a researcher in this yourself. There's a lot of ways to, to gain information, but also share, to read and to share the social side. Seek transcendental experiences. And by transcendental, I mean, there are, there are things that are the, in the mundane, everyday things that we don't notice. But there are things that surpass the mundane. There might be an heirloom from your grandfather that you're going to protect because it gives you an experience that transcends the ordinary. Years ago, when we had a meeting at the Joyce Beer Center where we talked about, is humanism a religion? It was in June of, I don't know, 2011. And we were talking at the Joyce Beer Center on, is, is humanism a religion? And we talked about transcendental experiences in humanism and that evening, at that time, we had a partial solar eclipse. And Mike Lewis brought some, some eclipse glasses. And we stopped our meeting to go outside to, to experience this eclipse. When we talked about free speech in our, our meeting, Coffee and Conversation, a handful of people said that there are people who abuse free speech. And yet, the rallying cry from our group is, yeah, they're obnoxious, but we find free speech to be so important. Set aside. The word taboo is a Maori word for set aside. And that's where we get the word taboo. The word in, Is in Arabic, in, in Islam, for that which is set aside, forbidden for mundane hands, which is either something that's impure, or something that's quite pure, is Haram, and that's where we get the term harem. There's halal, and there's haram, something that's set aside and impermissible. But nature, nature fills us with an abiding sense of wonder. Baron Dolbach, who we've talked about before when we've gone over historical atheism and historical religious critique, Bernd Dolbach said, the intellectual man even forgets himself in the contemplation of nature. And as Keltner says, to cultivate awe, a greater sense of our connection with the world around us, to see our place in the world, to cultivate a sense of reverence, not only of the natural world, but of each other to see the human being as an individual worthy of dignity, having respected dignity, and to see that our community is something worthwhile, that it's something for us to contribute to because we get meaning out of those relationships. And with the sense of awe, we can minimize opportunities for corruption because we have that commitment and we, we activate those pro-social centers of our brain. And lastly, volunteer. They're doing those pro-social acts, talking about Zach and Keltner and oxytocin, dopamine, and serotonin. Volunteer. You'll feel good. These pro-social acts will help you feel good, help you build new bonds with people. And that radiates out. That develops trust. And with, with Putnam and social capital, when you have worthwhile trust in other people that you cultivate, which trust is so such a beautiful commodity that it's hard to come by, easily lost, and even harder to rebuild. But to build or organically build trust, to do that by doing pro-social acts, that benefits society. And then experience gratitude, like in Buddhism, like in Buddhism, 
with gratitude and giving, the Buddhist monks have to beg for food. They, they, they beg the, the, the community for their breakfast and their lunch through humility. And they say that it gives people the opportunity to be generous. And also with Paul Zak, with, with these games, these economic games like the ultimatum test where you're given a, cert, a set amount of money, volunteers come in and say, hey, you have $10. And um, you have someone on the other side who you don't know, but you can choose to give them you can choose to give them a portion of the $10 that you're given. And if you, if, and then you, they can develop that to several rounds to increase the amount of, of money you have coming in. But you can also do versions where you can say, you have to both decide, you have to give them, you can either give them a portion or not. But if they don't, if they don't agree with the portion that you're taking home, you have to also take into consideration you're not getting anything. And for the most part, the generally accepted amount in the United States is around 40 to 45%. Other, other places, like is described in um, Very Bad Wizard, um, the other person might take 5%. The respondent might take 5%. But here, it's, it's, it's an expected equality. And then, Lastly, as Dr. Pfaff says in Altruistic Brain, you, you start working for social conditions that minimize chronic stress and you encourage empathy and altruism. Where, where uh, uh, an environment of empathy and altruism will flourish. And then he also brings up that if you really want to change things in society, break down the barriers, looking at the neurology of women and how they process oxytocin and how the in, in women the social cognition is much stronger than in men so he says that if you want to have a more just society break down the barriers for opportunities for women to lead in government and the humanist creed which is attributed to robert green ingersoll takes this into account all of these things, written long before ethology and functional magnetic resonance imaging and the understanding of oxytocin. Ingersoll's humanist creed says, justice is the only worship, love is the only priest, ignorance is the only slavery, happiness is the only good, the time to be happy is now, the place to be happy is here. And of course, the way to be happy is to make others so. Wisdom is the science of happiness. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Okay. So I want to lead into lead into discussion now. Wow. If this 101 is basic, what's 102 going to be like? Well, we'll get, that would, we're going to go into. And to, to more into the neurology, I think, if we do a 102, but. Well, that was a good presentation, Jason. <clears throat> Going from philosophy to neuroscience to um, ethics and morality. And um, wow, that was quite a gamut of different topics, well-researched. Um, and you touched on a lot of things that I have, I have studied in the past um, regard, with regards to music and neuroscience and the release of oxytocin and mirror neurons and uh, yeah a lot of that was familiar territory but um, certainly you've covered an even wider breadth of um, uh, human, uh, human thought and how, how we process emotions and empathy and um, oh yeah well the, the thing is that this this subject it's it's so easy to argue with because it's oh, well, we're just going to be selfish, or, or that's just not how we are. The thing is that I think we have to do triage, and we have to unpack that for a long time. That's what philosophy was telling us. And we have to recognize our, our preconceived notions. And then we go into the fact that it's not just neurologists who are studying this, but this is the way the social scientists are studying it. And a lot of what we thought in the past is incorrect. 
And I think we are selfish to some extent, but this provides me with a lot of hope. And the fact that if we can concentrate on the fact that the building blocks of who we are is pro-social, altruistic, and we, and like little things like embarrassment shuts us down so we don't fight and laughter shuts us down so we don't fight and unites us all together. And like, even though we can't do touch right now, we can gossip and we, you know, like pro-socially gossip, I shouldn't say be assholes, but yeah, there's, there's a lot on this topic, a lot on this topic. Yeah, and I think the more that we know about ourselves, the more we can uh, guide ourselves in a direction that in which we want to go. If we want to be a more uh, empathetic culture, then we cultivate, cultivate that part of ourselves that, um, that uh, creates that, and we direct our culture in that direction. So I think it's a conscious choice that we, that we can make, and the research is showing that um, are, are the tools that we can use to develop the parts of our nature that uh, we, we value, right? Yeah. Um, so um, it, interesting. Yeah, very fascinating research. Um, one, one of the things I thought that was particularly interesting is that this person doesn't have a political dog to speak of. They're just talking about how we can encourage a, a more, a more empathic society and he's a neurologist he says that we have to we have to minimize barriers for women in governance i thought that was really interesting well it makes sense and it makes sense to uh, minimize barriers for uh, those who are typically not part of uh, the uh, dominant um, leadership structure um, in general um, this is how we um, um, learn from a variety of ideas as opposed to one singular um, dominant idea that probably has not served us very well, mm -hmm. at least not looking very good today. Yeah, and I don't know, the thinking of the, the pandemic, there was a, I think it was from The Economist, and it was saying that countries with women in leadership shut down the virus. I mean, of course, we're looking at Germany did better than the United States, but some of these places are, are islands. And so they were mentioning like um, Iceland and New Zealand. But what did you guys disagree with about the talk? What points of contention did you find? I want to know that too. I want to hear the disagreements. I want, I want us to, to go down that, that road, unless we all agreed on it, which... I'm still waiting for a response from the Chicken Foundation. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't want to wait, I don't want to wait any more to hear from them. <laughs> Colonel Sanders is on the line right now. Oh, no. <laughs> you broke the social contract on that one. Um. <laughs> yeah, and the... Uh, I don't know if this is appropriate, but um, uh, we have a, a relative who is a public defender and uh, many years ago, early in her career, she was uh, defending a guy who was pulled over on the freeway here in the Los Angeles area because the police was following him and saw some feathers coming out of his window and then more feathers and then they turned their lights on and a whole chicken came out. And when the guy was pulled over and the officer came up to the car, uh, his uh, response was, officer, I didn't fuck that chicken. And so and then she, this is a true story, and she had to defend this guy. So, But that chicken was still alive, so there, there was a problem. <laughs> That's bad. <laughs> it's a true story. <laughs> hey, Jason, uh -huh. I almost fell out of the chair while you were talking because I almost fell asleep, but uh, I'm 85, and I... Hard to That's okay, Jim. <laughs> I mean, all of the, the breadth of what Jason was talking about, I think could be uh, even, and I think I, we, I've said this before in, in, a, in, a past, um, in a past presentation that there's so much that you've covered that you can separate out some of this, some of these topics and then just yeah. go uh, 
a little bit more in depth and, and have discussions over one particular topic. That is that, um, uh, yeah, the, the, the breadth is so wide and, and, it, and each one is very interesting, I found it. Yeah, I just have a problem with getting too fascinated by this stuff. <laughs> it is fascinating, I have to say that. Fascinating. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm gonna have to leave it close to three. Um, there is a, a memorial for Ed Brayton, and I don't know if you guys know who Ed Brayton is, but he was a big um, a voice in our secular community, a writer. So I'm going to go to that memorial ceremony at uh, three o'clock. Thought I had um, that might be um, useful is there is the researcher at UCSD um, who uh, talks about what part of the brain lights up when we feel the presence of God. You know, uh -huh. like people who feel like you know they've they well, they've been in great despair and feel the presence of God, and that was. Uh, I think I may have given you his name before, but uh, that area of research is just fascinating. Oh, yeah. Um, how it's related to the, the helpless infant wanting mommy and um, um, some of the uh, fMRI studies that have been done on that. Yeah. And San Diego, so yay. Yay. Good. <laughs> Good. Uh, I just want to remind everybody of the motto of San Diego County. The noblest motive is the public good. Nice. So, so let's see. As we as we head into our our board meeting, which is coming up in a couple minutes. Um, any last thoughts from Bob, Brian, Jeremy, Nicole, or Patricia? I want to make sure everyone feels like they've had a chance to talk. I have one last thought. Sure. Today, I heard um, from Dr. Ike Barzare. He's had um, ALS for the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. He invented a device where he can play the guitar because he lost the use of his fingers with a light bulb. <laughs> he's been doing it for four years and he's been on TV playing a, a guitar with a light bulb. <laughs> he can hit the different, different strings. So that was very inspirational for me. Nice. That'll be interesting to see. Uh, uh, let me just add one thought. Uh, as they were talking about touch as being positive, mm -hmm. I kept thinking about the Me Too and um, unwanted touch that women often get. So it has to be something that um, is gender neutral kind of touch, not. Uh, just any touch. Oh yeah, it, it has to be nurturing consensual touch. Exactly, because just saying touch is, is new, nurturing, you know, some guys might get the idea that anything goes. Oh yeah, that would, that would actually, from, from what I've read, that would spike epinephrine and that would shut down, that would shut down oxytocin, so. Exactly. Somebody ought to tell Biden. Yes, <laughs> and Trump, that his touches are unwelcome. Yeah. <laughs> That's all I needed. <laughs> I did not touch that woman. <laughs> and for some reason, it won't copy and paste, but just a quick overview. Um, if you like this, books to get Dan Ariely's Predictably Irrational, Friends to Walls, Age of Empathy, Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Thinking Fast and Slow, Dasher Keldner, Born to be Good, Tally Mandelberg, The Race Card, Donald Pfaff, Altruistic Brain, Robert Putnam, Making Democracy Work, Taylor Somers, Very Bad Wizard, Richard Thaler, Misbehaving, um, The Making of Behavioral Econ, Paul Zak, The Moral Molecule, and Jamil Zaki, The War for Kindness. Those are, those are books that I use for this talk. And okay. when I, when I, out, when I, you guys, they enjoyed it. Bye -bye. Later, and when I've given talks on, on, this, on this topic before, um, I talk not exactly on this topic, but some of the neurology of, of, of norms. Um, I, I bring junk food crickets, like sour cream and onion flavored crickets and, and macaroni and cheese, bacon macaroni and cheese flavored crickets. And I see if people can overcome their normative programming. Thank you come overcome their normative programming by eating a cricket. And by the end, they, they don't at first, but by the end, I'm out of crickets. So. 
I've it. eaten mealworms before, so that was when I was in like elementary school. If you bring chickens to the meeting, I'm leaving. <laughs> <laughs>